This is not a race against the machines. This is a race with the machines. So, David, uh, we've sent I've sent you a couple of uh, ways we can do this. Uh, honestly, this is whatever you feel more comfortable with. I think we're just uh, you know we're just keen at building turnaround and meeting interesting people. That, 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 that's the main thing, and having these great conversations. So, there's the 27T prompt, but it could be anything else. I think we're all interested in listening to what you have to say. Yeah. So I yeah. So I, it's amazing actually. There's lots we could talk about um, based on what I just heard, but I, um, I do have some, I put some slides together. I mean, you might have seen some of them before, in which case I apologize, um, but they might give us some structure for discussion actually. So well, I'm happy for you to interject at any point with questions, remarks, improvements, but maybe that's a good way to go. And so I'll share my screen and because I did want to make a point and I, you know, challenged by your, what did we get right thing? And I, I don't think we can ever answer that question. I think that it would simply be too easy to say, well, we solved economic inequality. We got that right. And then we solved climate and we got that right. And, and I think that uh, getting things right is very, very hard and getting things wrong is very, very easy. And, um, and it's that asymmetry that is the challenge of civilization. So I'm going to go through um, some slides uh, and, you know, they're hopefully not too boring. Um, so let's see. Now that we're all Zoom adepts. And uh, everyone see that? Great. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I just said. Um, so, the basic structure I have in mind is the following, and, I, and I'm, I'm a little bit inspired by this uh, email Olivia sent. Um, so I'm going to, the only way to go forward 50 years is to go back and I'm going to go back in relation to complexity science, the thing that I know more about. Um, there are many things one could talk about, but I'll talk about what I know better. Um, then I'll talk about our predicament in relation to that past and the implications of that for the next 50 years. So kind of a big thing, but it's a bit of a hodgepodge of slides and Let's see if it coheres. If it doesn't, just say something. Um, so one is the past. So in relation to us at SFI, we're all theorists. Um, many of us trained in mathematics, many physicists, also biologists, my background. Um, in about 1970s, uh, 50 years ago, we were living in a world by virtue of technologies of, of um, collider technologies, we had discovered a zoo of particles and Anita would be hip to this. And it wasn't clear at all how they related to each other. It was just a world of extraordinary diversity. And the standard model was developed, which is quite a big set of models, to be honest, a mathematical principles that were an effort to unify, provide a principal taxonomy for all the weirdness of the subatomic domain. And one of the extraordinary things, and this is a quote from one of our founders at SFI, Murray Gilman, who won the Nobel Prize in 1969. This he, he wrote in his Nobel acceptance speech, I think it's kind of beautiful. How can it be that writing down a few simple and elegant formulae, like short poems governed by strict rules, such as those of the sonnet or the waka, the Japanese verse form, can predict universal regularities of nature? And this is the great mystery of applied mathematics, right? Uh, what Eugene Wigner um, described as the surprising effectiveness of the mathematics in the natural sciences. How does that work? And uh, I, we could, I could talk about that a lot at length, and I'm sure we could all could. Um, but the basic underpinning of this fact is symmetry. This is Murray in the 1960s. It looks like he's voguing. I have no idea what that position is, but it's very cool. And uh, what Murray did, of course, is he um, created what we now know as the Eightfold Way. It was very inspired, uh, in title at least, by the Noble Eightfold Path of Buddhism. And Murray used the mathematics of Lie groups, um, a continuous group theory, um, to derive and predict the existence of particles that had not been discovered based on symmetries. Um, and they're shown here uh, these beautiful little wheels 
and on the, every vertex of those little wheels is a particle. And when you rotate those wheels, you essentially create a new particle. And he discovered particles that people had not yet observed. So this is the world of, of, of theoretical physics, the world of symmetries. And the other founder of SFI was this chap, his name's Phil Anderson. He won the Nobel Prize also in 1977. And he made this nice quote. He said, it's only slightly overstating the case to say that physics is, is the study of symmetries along the lines of those I just showed you. But, um, but Phil was very remarkable. He was the third best Go player in the world for a while, actually. That's sort of a bit frightening because we all play Go at SFI and uh, you don't even look at the board when Phil was in the building. Um, but he also made this deeper point, which is that uh, the study of complex systems, uh, the systems that we care about, I think, in this room, um, is not the study of symmetries, it's the study of broken symmetries. Um, and, I'll, and I'll just show you what I mean by that. Imagine you have a little ball, it's perched over these two little uh, valleys. Uh, left and right are symmetric. It, the ball has no preference for either. But if there's some kind of random perturbation or some change in the environment, the ball will fall into one or the other. And that will then remain stable. And that's what's meant by broken symmetries. And the history of life is a history of the accumulated breaking of symmetries. Uh, that have given rise to structure that we care about. Okay. And this is the canonical 50 years back, so I'm doing that game, um, that really is the founding document, I think, of our field. Uh, Phil's paper, More is Different, um, that gives the most cogent justification for why we should be studying poetry and history and physics and biology uh, and so forth, rather than just all doing quantum mechanics, because everything else is derivative of it. Uh, we can, the complex system science doesn't only find unification, it seeks to explain why diversity of insight uh, is required. Uh, and so this paper, I think, lays it out. So some of you might have seen this. This is how I explain complexity in terms of randomness, these broken symmetries, if you like. There's this world that studies very regular things, um, like orbits. And they're so regular that every culture on Earth sees them almost immediately and encodes them in beautiful artworks, in architecture, and in theories, in calendars. And uh, that's the world of classical mechanics, super regular, very low complexity world of symmetry. Um, you add a little bit of uh, randomness and you get to this world of quantum mechanics. It's still not very complex, it's difficult. Um, and all the way over there in the world of the totally random, interestingly, uh, you can have quite simple formulations as well. Um, there you're not so much breaking all these symmetries, you're starting with a lot of randomness that you average away. And in the middle, uh, is this world where broken symmetry reigns, um, where both the regular and the random are in some ongoing conversation, and it leads to things like life and culture. Um, and underpinning these phenomena are mathematical formalisms. The regular, we get, we can write down Hamiltonians or wave equations or, or the uh, laws of thermodynamics for the random. But in the middle, in this reign of broken symmetry, we don't know what to write down. <laughs> and, uh, and so what's happened, and this is the first point I think for this group, is the landscape of broken symmetry has bifurcated. It's led to on the one hand, things like complexity science, these very coarse grain paradigms that help us understand the world. And on the other hand, code, machine learning and AI, which help us predict the world. And understanding and prediction are not the same thing. We can discuss that <laughs> at length. Um, but society, which is so uh, utilitarian, favors prediction over understanding. And so it's led to a very interesting challenge. And I would argue we are at the tipping point of deciding which of these paths we pursue and perhaps, you know, 
we should pursue both. I mean, that's my view, but people are um, very um, doctrinaire about this. Point one, okay. Point two, a little bit of history. Um, human beings, uh, modern human beings are about 200,000 years old. And we emerged in the middle upper Paleolithic. Uh, tools appeared about two million years ago with Homo habilis. Uh, biologically, we're not that different from Homo habilis, right? Um, but we're not different at all from um, essentially the earliest modern humans of, of about 300,000 years ago. So this is our biological timeline. Let's look at the cultural timeline. Almost everything we're taught about culture um, is less than 5,000 years old. You can go certainly to uh, cave paintings and petroglyphs and so on, which are older, maybe 10 to 15,000 years. But everything we learned in school about ancient Sumer, Babylonian society, uh, the Egyptians and the Greeks, this is very, very recent, right? Uh, 5,000 years. And the technologies we're using to do this <laughs> uh, now are on the order of, uh, I don't know, 70 years old. And this gives rise to a real paradox that hasn't received enough attention. And I call it the um, problem of the Paleolithic hacker. If I gave you the operating system I'm now running rather imprudently, uh, Big Sur, the latest Mac OS operating system, you could not run it on a computer from the 1940s. And you'd say, well, duh. You can't run this operating system on a Mac that's 10 years old. Okay, but we humans are running ideas, political, economic, scientific, on biological hardware that's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years old. So how is it possible <laughs> that human beings can run such modern ideas on such ancient tech? <laughs> okay, and, and the answer is, well, and we could get into the, does someone plasticity? Have a <laughs> oh, does it, sorry. Neuroplasticity? Well, right, okay. So it, it reveals the fundamental limitation of the hardware software metaphor. Uh, and that somehow we've evolved a learning brain that somehow can keep up to some extent with what the collective is producing in culture. But there are limits. Um, Lee Seidel, the, arguably the greatest Go player who ever lived, does not understand uh, what his adversary from DeepMind uh, AlphaZero now most recently is doing. That's a completely opaque machine learning system. We, the world over, have absolutely no idea what the hell is going on in our political institutions, right? That on the one hand, uh, the world might think there was one outcome and others believe firmly that there was another. And this is not just the US. I mean, it's Britain and it's Hungary and it's Poland and it's on and on and on. Um, the political institutions within which we live have become to us surrealism. And, uh, and I think the reason is they're excessively complex. Um, our human brain can't keep up. So that's the second point, and I'm coming to the end, I won't be very long. The way that we've coped with this opacity of complexity um, is by building tools. And again, I apologize if some of you know this, um, I divide tools into two classes. Here's one class, I call these complementary cognitive artifacts, numbers, the abacus, say, maps, and some mechanical instruments. And let me explain what I mean by complementary. Language could be in there too, by the way, uh, written language or spoken. When we learn numbers, it really empowers us. Um, I can teach you a number system and then remove the physical artifact or paper and pen or pencil or chalk and you're still able to perform basic calculations in your head. The same is true of a map, right? We collectively create a map. You can look at it, 
partially memorize it. And if I take the map away, you're better at navigating through space. And this is one history of technology. Um, there is another history of technology that gives rise to competitive cognitive artifacts, like the calculator, classifier systems and machine learning, and things like driverless cars. Now, these artifacts, when we are with them, <laughs> make us better at a given function. But if you take them away, unlike numbers or language or maps, you're worse than when you started typically, or at best, no better. Okay, this is a very important distinction. And so these are the two kinds of technologies that we have to think about. One are collective amplifiers of human reason, uh, numbers, language, and so forth. And the others are collective analogs of human reason, and actually, in the limit, competitors to human reason. There's lots and lots of data to suggest that those competitors are deleterious. And this will be the final sort of summarizing set of slides. Here we have two axes. One on the x-axis is we have human ability or skill. If you're very skilled, we call that expertise. In fact, I've spent most of COVID working uh, with um, record-breaking Rubik's Cube uh, com contestants. Uh, I have a big interest in Rubik's Cube. Rubik's Cubes, in fact, yeah, this is the best Rubik's Cube ever. This is the labyrinth Rubik's Cube. To solve this cube, you have to solve the labyrinth on every side. It's, uh, it's very hard. So I can't even get one face, just to put that in perspective. So, um, so that's the x-axis. On the y-axis um, is the difficulty of using an artifact, a violin, a tennis racket, a pencil. And we can divide this space on the x-axis, we call high expertise talent. I'm not making any statement here, by the way, of whether that's innate or learned. That's, this is agnostic about that. If you're compromised, that is below normal, as I am with vision, I have a disability. That is, I have to rectify my, my uh, compromised vision with a tool. Um, and on the y-axis, your ability to use the tool, whether you're trained in it or untrained. So down there in the lower right, someone who has enormous skill and effortlessly wields the artifact, we would call, say, a professional, a professional tennis player, a professional violinist, and so on. This is tricky. Individuals who have a below statistical normal ability, um, we typically think of uh, giving them an artifact as a treatment. This is interesting to find the right language for this, incidentally. Um, this is quite challenging. Someone who is very expert, but who has yet to master the artifact, we call a novice. And the top left, that is, you have compromised skill, that is, minus the artifact, uh, and you find the artifact very difficult to use, we call that, say, untreated. Now, the key point here is this. The complementary artifacts provide a positive training vector on human cognition, such that you move to the lower right quadrant of this picture. Meaning, if I give you a violin or a piano uh, or chopsticks or you pick, they work with you, right, to increase your skill uh, such that you become more expert and the artifact becomes easier to use. The competitive artifact has a different vector. It gets easier to use. I mean, I'm better at using my iPhone today than I was 10 years ago, but my level of expertise has diminished in any task that I assign it to. And this is the world that I'm worried about in the next 50 years. It's a world that comes about by virtue of those broken symmetries. That is, this state space is the space of complex problems, not simple problems for which we already have good solutions. Um, we're challenged by the limits of our own paleolithic brain 
and we invest in better and better tools. The tools that historically we have created have been extraordinary in increasing our expertise when they're not present. But we're moving into a world where I think the danger is not an AI that will you know, turn us into a battery, uh, but an AI that will turn us into a jellyfish. And if you think I'm joking, I'm, you know I'm not. This is a, a fairly recent article of a group of individuals who were so obsessed with looking at the GPS in their cars that they didn't realize that you know, the cars right in front of them had already driven into a ditch. And so, and this, we can laugh at it together, but this is really what we're doing in our political institutions. It's what we're doing with the planet as a whole. And uh, that is the technology that I desperately want to avoid. I thought I'd just finish, with, since you're all in, in Canada, with a film that we're all really looking forward to, or certainly I am, uh, which is Denis Villeneuve's new Making of Dune, uh, which of course got delayed because of COVID. That was based on a novel written by Frank Herbert in 65, that I'm sure many people here have read. Um, but Herbert was very inspired by Samuel Butler's, Butler's 19, 1872 uh, philosophical fantasy, Erewhon, which by the way, if you read backwards, reads nowhere. Um, and in Erewhon, Butler introduced the idea of um, the phrase, uh, Darwin among the machines, that my friend George Dyson then turned into a book. And Butler was concerned that evolution would move from the organic domain to the mechanical, and we'd create a world where we're essentially ruled over by benign robots. And the answer in Dune, I'm not sure how Villeneuve will deal with this, was the so-called Butlerian Jihad. This comes from Samuel Butler, or the Great Revolt. Uh, and this was that human beings in this Dune future decided to eliminate all calculating technology. Um, and uh, the, the, the rallying cry of this revolution was man may not be replaced. The problem, by the way, as for those who have read uh, Dune, was eugenics. In other words, they eliminated the division of labor, cognitive division of labor, and created it in humans. So in fact, it was almost worse. But I want to point out that that's real. I, I can imagine uh, the revolt against mechanization would be met by something as odious, actually. Um, and in this case, possibly worse. So with all of those points in play, I thought we might have a good argument discussion. All right, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, I'm sure we'll have many, many questions. I have myself a lot of questions, but I'll let the, if, I think that Sherry raised her hand, and then Jill, and then Anita. Uh, so let's go with, uh, where, where's Sherry? It's our, uh, there we go. Sherry, go first, and then Jill, and then Anita. Thank you. Well, first of all, David, that was absolutely fascinating. I have so many thoughts running around in my head right now, but as you were showing us that graph about the training vectors, uh, one thing that immediately came to my mind as like a brightening sensation, I just wanted to ask your take on this. You said that your worry is these competitive artifacts are essentially deteriorating to sort of human cognitive functions in a way as well, because of you know, the dependence and the emergence of these tools are moving us towards the untreated region on the graph. But my question is, is the origin of that concern our essential definition of what the boundaries of human cognition is? We think everything that characterizes human cognition happens within the physical boundaries of the body, but we already know that there's a lot of scholars out there, like Clark and Chalmers, you know, Hutchinson's with his cockpit story, that human cognition doesn't exist in just the body, that your, your mind is embedded in the environment around you. It's the nervous system, it's the body, but it's also the environment. That when someone who has, let's say, dementia, or you know, someone who has, like, uh, you know, maybe they have a disability in memory, when you write something on the notebook and you say, oh God, I don't remember where the museum is, let me take out my notebook and find it, you know, that the ability to use your environment to support your cognitive processes is not not part of what human cognition is. Is that 
cut off from, from us as a being and in that on these competitive artifacts, even though you're right in that when we take them away, we're worse off, but maybe that's the point. Maybe human cognition, if we were to understand it as an embedded system, that the fact that we have AI, the fact that we have automated cars, it's not deteriorating our cognition. It's just an extension now as what our human processes are. And then in that way, are we still moving towards the untreated zone? Or is that like a different understanding if we were to just shift our boundaries in, of our understanding? Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. So a few things to say. Um, so to the first half of your remark, I absolutely agree. In other words, those complementary artifacts are precisely those outsourced um, affordances that we benefit from. So I'm not claiming that uh, technology is bad or that human cognition sort of stops at the boundary of the skull, right? Absolutely right. Um, so that's the first point. So I think I agree with all of that. The second, it's where this is the second one that gets challenging, um, which is the competitive artifact. You know, look, I live in uh, New Mexico. I live in a very, very large state. It's very sparse. I have a car, okay? Um, it's the only way to get around. And the, now a car allows you to move very quickly um, from point A to point B, but with significant externalities, right, in terms of pollution and the implications on global warming. And it's also not good for me physically, particularly. I mean, if I sat in my car all the time, A, you know, I sort of, I'm inert and I'm not moving enough. And B, I can hit other people, right? So in every respect, other than minimizing the time, a car is a terrible, terrible thing. Okay. And I think what we have to do is devise a kind of calculus that allows us to assign reasonable numbers or qualities, if you'd rather do it that way, to the benefit to the individual uh, and to a society, quite frankly, um, but also the costs. And I think that, okay, so that's the second point, how we do that. And I don't know how to do that. Um, and, and a refinement on that is that where do we draw the line? And, and I've said that in some of these interviews, right? In other words, I know perfectly well that the best way for me to vote is to download all of my details and political sympathies to an app and be told who to vote for, as opposed to rely on my uh, near reflex <laughs> uh, response on in a particularly emotional day, you know? And, um, but that doesn't just extend to voting, it extends to my diet. I mean, really, if I told my phone my state of physiology, uh, and my, it, would, it should tell me what to eat. David, it's Tuesday, this is what you should eat. And then my friends, it should tell me who I should consort with because I've told them my values in advance, which is what Facebook already does and ruins people. Um, so I think that the inexorable creep of outsourcing decisions and free will, I think that's what's really at stake, um, to competitive cognitive artifacts, the omega point of that process, that is its absorbing state, is that human beings are these sort of little layers of tissue that somehow are plastered onto the surface of the earth, extracting disproportionate quantities of energy and giving nothing back, you know? So, I, I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the, the, the ratchet. That's fascinating. Thank you. I'm going to yield the floor because I know there's a ton of questions. So. Jill, you didn't raise your hand, right? You just clapped, right? Yeah, no, I just clapped. It's Salome's turn. No, wait, it's Anita first. First it's Anita and then Salome. Oh, good, because I'm going to forget what I want to ask. Um, so my question is a practical question, and I've been thinking about it probably for a long time, that I'd be curious to know from you. Um, I think oftentimes when I listen to your interviews, I get the impression that we design systems based on the individual, even though we know that when autonomous beings come together, they make a complex system and it might be wiser to... So the, my question is, what are our blind spots? And can you comment on, maybe just to give us some advice, because here we are, looking at the system of education. And I assume that I also have blind spots in, 
in how I'm examining it. And then I wanted to couch it in a caveat, which comes to this notion of, if we're trying to find the language of broken symmetries, then aren't we feeding into our own blind spots because we're assuming that it can be quantified in some tidy set of equations the same way. And so how do we avoid, essentially what I wanna know is how do I avoid, or how do you avoid with this knowledge, considering these systems around us without falling into blind spots? Yeah, well, I don't, I mean, in some sense, I'm so full of them, but that, that I wouldn't be able to answer. So, and so, because you're sort of stumbling into these. I, so it's a very big question. Let me just deal with a part towards the end, which had to do with um, the tyranny of quantity and the limitations of formal thought. Um, and perhaps this gets to uh, one of these discussions that was being had about the, the interface of, of a certain style of reasoning with transcendental styles of reasoning. Um, I believe, and I've said this many times, that to understand human decisions, uh, human um, ambitions, one should read novels. Okay? And um, Wittgenstein made this point very clearly in his later works on psychology. Um, which is if you wanted to really get a philosophical idea across um, viscerally, the best way to do it would be in a novel, in a narrative, mm. and not in a formal philosophical exposition. And, you know, it's interesting, I don't know how many people here have read uh, War and Peace, but Tolstoy was very interested in statistical mechanics um, and had a correspondent, correspondence with some very prominent mathematicians. Um, and if you read War and Peace to the end, <laughs> um, and the new translation is very good um, by Volokhinsky and Pavia, which is in, sen in some sense a very interesting collaboration that we could talk about separately. Um, the first part is the novel, but the last part is his essay on statistical mechanics and uh, how history works, which is very weird and people complain about it. Um, and I think it highlights the difference between an insight that comes through ontological experimentation, that is the novel, um, versus abstraction. So I wanted to say that because society has organically discovered the blind spots of science, right? In other words, we collectively resist <laughs> uh, excessively reductionist styles of reasoning. This group resists that. I mean, in other words, we study music, not just, you know, Helmholtzian neurophysiology of the ear. I mean, there's so I think there probably is a kind of science that would tell us why that must be true. How many levels should exist in our understanding of the world? I actually believe that it ought to. It looks a little bit like renormalization group, but done in a very weird way, perhaps. Um, so scientists, so I do think you're right, have a causality blind spot. Um, my brother is quite a well-known neuroscientist and we work together and um, not the mountain climber. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, um, and he always comes across this problem that neuroscientists, they'll say, how can we understand uh, pain? How can we understand hate? How can we understand and so on? Well, there's this compound that's released, right? In other words, the neural correlates, psychopharmological correlates um, that are statistical. And um, why does that satisfy some people? And I have this all the time when I'm meeting with people. They'll say, they're more satisfied by an explanation articulated in terms of some reductive atomistic principle than same level epistemology. And again, we could do that. So, I think that's a huge blind spot in scientists. Um, and I think humanists have their own. I, I happen to be a scientist, so I'm more familiar with, <laughs> with those. Mm -hmm. but, but that's a bit of a problem. Um, and it shows a disrespect, I think, for the diversity of ideas that we need. So, mm -hmm. big problem. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, Salome, Upasana, Easton, and Julien, and then, uh, you know, we don't want to overburden our host, and then we'll see if we move forward or if we stop. So, no, Salome. Don't overburden me, Olivia. That's good. It's, it's, 
is good. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. So, Salome, you're next. Mm -hmm. Hi, well, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. Um, I wanted to explain a little bit. Personally, I um, decided to go into the scientific field and to study molecular biology specifically because I was so fascinated by the idea of complexity and the, the idea that we can have such profound simplicity um, in what we're studying, but it, it really goes to show that there is such a variety of ways in which life can express itself and our adaptive potential is absolutely incredible. In my opinion, my project, um, my inspiration was actually um, kinetic cascades because that is what I mainly studied, a lot of biochemistry, a lot of molecular biology. And I was so interested with this question that you've, you've brought up, which is there is this force and simplicity. It's, it's, um, it's something that renders so much meaning and so much clarity Yet at the same time, it's, um, it's not paradoxical, but um, there's a limitation to that because we know that so much can come about um, from, from, these, from these equations, from the scientific knowledge. For my research, a big point of inspiration is um, Out of Chaos Order by Isabel Stengers. And I've just been dealing with these contradictory opinions on like basic epistemological questions of is life um, the manifestation of moving beyond certain architectural constraints I think I'd written down who would someone had uh, someone had mentioned that um, compared to another view which is well there's actually um, architecturally speaking that doesn't really make sense as much and it's the microscopic interactions which make life so meaningful and so interesting. Um, this was more of a comment, but you were clear that being incredibly complex, but also an incredibly foreign world. I don't know if I can speak on behalf of everyone, but it feels like there is a, sometimes a huge detachment between what I'm experiencing and what is going on, and we don't always understand. Do you do you think that complexity science can give us a new insight into understanding? profound complexity and uncertainty um, and the unknown, which is what we're heading into, not only with coronavirus, but in the next 50 years with technology. Um, I've tried to think about this myself, but since you're the expert, would you care to elaborate on that? Well, okay, expert, <laughs> I think about it. <laughs> so here's, here's, I want to show you something, which is, I'm not sure this is useful, but I kind of enjoy doing this. You were taught recently and I introduced an idea which I call complexity claustrophobia. And I want to show you this because I think it's kind of fun. And so, and it does bear on the final part of your question. Um, and let's see, um, here we are. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, so here's the thing. So let me just tell you why I'm thinking about this because I think it's a, the last part, the first part we get back to. Um, oops, how do I do this? Oh, it's, it's not in that mode. Um, so here's claustrophobia. It was defined in the 1870s, and we all know, um, and I actually am claustrophobic, so I, that's why I'm interested in this, um, the fear of enclosed spaces. And Freud tried to root it in one of his slightly strange theories. And this is one of my preferred Freudian approaches. And he said that there is some anxiety and um, that anxiety is moved. And uh, he called that transference in his language. But so you associate one thing with another through an associative path, that's called transference. And you project that anxiety that you feel onto an object. That's called the phobic object. And for a claustrophobic person, that anxiety you feel, which could come from multiple sources, is projected onto an enclosed space. And so my, my anxiety is probably the fear of human stupidity uh, gets sort of projected onto closed spaces. I don't know. Whatever it is, uh, it, I suffer claustrophobia. And I don't think it's a fear of space. It's a fear of something else. And here's what I want to suggest. I think that we're suffering from complexity claustrophobia, that the anxiety that we're all feeling now is just this total uncertainty and incomprehension with the world, what you call detachment. Um, how, what on earth is going on? You know, how do we make sense of all of this? And I think the 
phobic object that that uncertainty, be, uncertainty be, is being projected onto in the modern world is interventions. And so when we see things like this, um, anti-vaccination, um, the fact that a mask, which is like a sock, you know, has become a symbol of tyranny, uh, that CO2 is actually something we want more of in our atmosphere, et cetera. But the, what I think is happening here is not that people are stupid here, is that they're suffering from complexity claustrophobia, that the unbelievable complexity of the modern world that we live in is so hard to fathom uh, that we're projecting it onto the very means of its remediation. And so to get to your, so I can get rid of that, just want to make that point. I think the only answer is education, actually. I, I genuinely believe that what complexity science and other sciences are trying to do is make incursions into those domains of great uncertainty and incomprehension. They'll always remain. Uh, and it's not just science, by the way. You know, poetry makes great incursions into other domains of uncertainty. Um, but all of these, you know, very rich traditions that we've developed, um, they're the only remedy. I, I don't think there's a magic bullet except, and that's why I opened my talk with the future we want to avoid is going to be very difficult. It's very difficult because there's only one answer, and that is that you have to learn to live with the complexity. And I think the only way to do it is to engage with the difficulty. Um, so it's awful though, because I feel as if there's this vast swath of society who have chosen not to. And uh, I have no idea. I don't know how to, to do that. And I, I've always been very fond of entertainment. Someone mentioned humor. Um, I think that's really important. Um, film, literature, music. These are means of, of engaging with complexity, I think, very directly. I, but they don't seem to be enough. I mean, it's a big question you asked. I, that, that last bit, though, I just fixed in my brain. Thank you. Upasana? Uh, so this has been really uh, wonderful. I have such, like, it gave me such food for thought. So thank you for this. Uh, but and what I was thinking while I was listening was that, uh, I mean, if everything is about symmetry and broken symmetry, then why is it that we humans are fundamentally flawed? And is it a matter of broken symmetry only or are we not flawed the moment we are born? And and I was also wondering that if humans are just made of cells and cells follow a logic, then why is it that we, I mean, as a, as a composite being are so flawed and changeable, basically? Yeah, I, I love the fact that we're flawed. Um, so I want to make that point. I think I would like to change our um, attitudes towards flaws. So, and, and I really mean that, actually, um, because historically, accusations of abnormality, deviancy, madness, etc., um, were essentially the human distaste for the uncertain, right? I think it's the manifestation, actually, of what I just described, and you could use your own language for it. So I do want to make the point that I have nothing against flaws. I'm a champion of them. Um, however, what I'm not a champion of is flaws that get aggregated into bigotry or orthodoxies. And they're not the same thing. I think that's really important to understand that, 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 that human fallibility, human weakness, um, is not the same thing as human cruelty. Right? Uh, those things are often institutionally aided and abetted <laughs> through very reasonable, rational means using unflawed logic. I mean, flawed in its deepest sense, like racism or sexism, but you know, the institutional creation that, that bolsters those ideas is, is often, you know, in its own language efficient. So I think that um, I wouldn't want to equate, you know, this, 
undesirable social states with human weakness and vulnerability. I think it would be a mistake. So, um, and I, I, I think we need to work on that language somehow to make those things more positive. Um, why though, we don't do better um, is certainly beyond me, right? I think that, you know, I think the best I've, I believe, the very best you can do is make a local difference and make publicly available ideas that were useful to you in making your local difference so that someone else can use them to make a local difference. Um, that's the very best that I can come up with. I, I know that there are other people who have been immensely successful with global agendas, um, have had a very positive impact on the world. I, might, I think that age might be over. I think there may be too many of us, right? I mean, there are just so many people on the planet. Um, to be local now is to be global in the 18th century, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question I can't answer other than defend the flawed. I guess that's what I want you to do. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Upasana. Ethan, you're next. Um, I think what you guys are just talking about now seems to wrap around and connect with, with my question uh, that I thought of before. And so I'll bridge that first. Uh, I, I, some, I'm, I'm someone who, who, um, who has some experience in treating myself for ADHD. And a lot of people who don't really are kind of starting themselves uh, are kind of asking why why they should think that they are not less than other people. So I'm, I, like, I, I would like to encourage people and say like, no, like you have different needs. You don't, it's not that you have uh, a deficiency and you're missing out on something that other people have, that like you have different needs. And um, to connect that to this conversation, I feel like um, why are people, why do people feel so, uh, so flawed is maybe because someone people who are feel that they're having a lot of difficulty are maybe being asked to take on responsibilities that they're not very good at doing and this is depriving them from the time that they could be uh could spend on doing things that they are good at doing and so this this connects to uh to 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 my own question um about technologies uh that are helping us in, or versus technologies that are um, kind of replacing the need to, to be intelligent, uh, for example. Um, I, I find that when it comes to, um, say, like making an agenda or something, like making an agenda that t keeps track of my schedule, it kind of offloads the necessity for me to be thinking about what order do I do my different tasks today in? so that I can just already know that already, just look at my agenda. And then I can use my brain to think about things that are maybe a better use of my brain power, which is like higher, like higher thinking, uh, creative thinking on the problem itself. Um, I'm like, what would you have to say about, um, about technology even technology replacing the need to think about certain things so like exercise I can give an example one of the barriers for me for 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 getting into better shape has been I, I would have to study like a sequence of exercises and I would have to hold that in my head and do those instead I have an app I put in my weight I put in the number of push-ups I can do before I get tired and they give me this exercise regime and it allows me to kind of like easily take care of that but anyway, so do you have something to say about uh, the ability of technology to put us in a direction where the things that we're, that we're giving up, the decisions that we're giving up, empower us to do other things that we haven't had time to do before? Well, but it's, of course that's true, right? I mean, in other words, you know, if I had to walk to Albuquerque to take a plane, it would take a day, <laughs> but I can drive, it takes me an hour. So there's no denying <laughs> the functional value of technologies, both complementary and competitive. That's not 
the discussion, right? So I, they are all of utility. Um, I'm just trying to point out what I consider a dangerous path uh, with excessive outsourcing to competitive artifacts, right? So I just want to make that very clear. I'm not, I'm not a Luddite, right? you know, quite the opposite, right? Um, interestingly, your, your use of the agenda to me is a great example of a competitive pro as a complementary process because you know I, I have a knife I don't wear it very often but when I find myself being too sedentary I wear my iPhone right and it sort of reminds me and it that horrible canned messages that um, you know encouragement of various kinds and what that does it sort of trains me into a good habit and then I get rid of it and then I maintain it by memory right so that's a good example of using a device as a to amplify what would otherwise be a rather weak tendency without incentive or so on. But I don't want anyone to think I'm anti-tech. It's just that, uh, and I use all of these competitive technologies perhaps as much as anybody. It's just that there is a distinction, I think, between these. Uh, it's not hard, soft distinction, um, but the vector that we're following now is dangerous. And I think that things like social media, which I don't use in any form, incidentally, um, is playing into um, this risk. I might add that, you know, my brother, both brothers actually, and my younger brother as well, use a lot of social media and love it, you know? So uh, it's not, again, I, I shouldn't be a preacher about it, but I don't, and I don't for, for, for principled reasons, actually. Hey, yeah, you're next. Sure. Um, the question I had ties in with the earlier discussion about, uh, I guess, the adoption of tools based on their simplicity and, and the anxiety that comes with basically dealing with complexity. Um, and I keep thinking about the way, when you think about, say, the climate problem, which is, you know, a very prominent problem recently, it's basically that we've applied simple models of the world, right? Like, you know, the unbounded growth in economics, uh, the fact that the earth was a large system in which we could, you know, take whatever we wanted and, and put whatever we wanted as well as outputs and, you know, it would still be stable and steady. Um, those very simple models, like those mental models, so those complementary tools that you've mentioned, were extremely powerful, say, in generating utility in the broadest sense, right, in raising wealth, pharma, et cetera. But it seems like we're at a, at a point where we can't necessarily use those simple models anymore and we need to renew them with something that's a little more complex. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on uh, basically the, the baseline ability that we have as a society to function at the scale at which we are in the, right, in the geographically integrated way that we currently operate mm -hmm. while transitioning to those more complex models and, 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 and how that transition could be possible and what trade-offs would be possible. And to me, it seems like uh, transferring a lot of cognitive responsibility onto tools is a way to make space for those harder to, harder to process and harder to operate mental models that allow us to deal with you know, more complex solutions that might be more comprehensive. Yeah, that's a very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a whole research program, I think, that question, actually. I mean, many of these questions were. But I think that that... Um, I'll give you an example of that, actually, it, where it can go wrong. So um, I was very interested in the um, London Stock Exchange. And the London Stock Exchange was the first stock exchange to go fully automatic to be a kind of computational stock exchange. It's based on a structure called the order book structure. Um, and we've studied that extensively at SFI. Um, the basic idea here was that the stock market was too complicated. There are too many latencies. And the idea was to outsource actually elements of uncertainty into the mechanics of the system. What happened when that, uh, was that we could show, prove, that the best trading strategy with that new machine in place was a random walker, basically. 
We call, they're called Zero Intelligent Agents. And the first conference of Zero Intelligent Agents just took place this year under COVID, actually. Um, so we have to be careful, right? In other words, you, you're right. You're sort of suggesting, as I understand it, to paraphrase you, in lieu of these mental models that are more complex and respect various you know high density large number etc modern world we outsource to institutional structures machines and i would call a market a machine i don't doesn't just have to be like an ai thing um, um, elements of the decision making to give us time to breathe right and i think that's really interesting but what happened with the stock market is we never reclaimed it right in other words we put in place the structures and decision making rules whether we got wiser in the meantime i doubt but we never did that second step which i think you're suggesting which is okay we now get it give me it back give me back the controls we didn't and uh, that, that's really interesting and it's obvious i think why we didn't um, it, it, it's, it's really interesting question um one area that I've worked on a bit is on the history of institute constitutions, um, national constitutions, where really, as you, exactly to your point, the basic rule system in place, in, put in place in the late 18th century in the United States, um, was built for a world you know, with less than a billion people, obviously, considerably less. And there is no constitution that which is in some sense the OS of society um, that respects scale. It doesn't understand it. And if you look at the Indian constitution, which is the largest constitution on the planet uh, by word length, by word count, um, the way it's coped with scale is put in so many contingencies as to be unusable. And so that would be a good example where we've tried in some sense to augment <laughs> the institution, right? But it's become a bowl of spaghetti. But, uh, you know. <laughs> wow, this question square scale is, is, is really interesting, but I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I, don't, I wanna let students uh, ask their questions first. So Danielle, you're next. Thanks so much. Um, I, I, I really like that you um, brought back up humor again, because that, that was what I, uh, meant to ask about all along. So it seems that, you know, there's a, there's a fundamental element of, of humor comprehension and then appreciation, which is interesting in its own right, that is fundamental. Um, it's, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of aspects of it that are learned culturally. Um, and that's how they, they vary in a lot of ways, but there's also a fundamental mechanism um, that is automatic and, and built in to the human experience. Um, and it seems to me what a, a way that we, um, that we kind of offload our anxieties about our complexity, but also kind of revel, revel in that. And I was just curious as to what your experience um, thinking about that might be, and perhaps you know what that what that says about um, human beings and you know the way that we approach our problems. Yeah, again, I mean, it's so one of my colleagues, Dan Dennett, has written a book on humor, and Dan, mm -hmm. we've talked about this a lot. I don't buy his theories, but I will say that um, what I I've always thought that kind of scholarship is joking. And uh, I should sort of explain what I mean by that. I, I think you're right. I think that humor is one of those extraordinary psychological, cultural inventions that allows us to deal with complexity. I mean, any good joke is about something uncomfortable, right? That's, it's not binary. It's, it's sort of, oh, yeah. So it has that really nice quality that it shows us what we've been incapable of saying, right? Or, or, or addressing directly. And I think science, I mean, I'll give these off for I don't mean to be, um, um, reduce this just to science. When I may say science, I mean scholarship, but what I'm trained in is, is in natural science. Um, so 
you know, I think when Kepler showed Tycho Brahe his model for the orbits of the planets, which was this ellipse, and Tycho Brahe, the Tychonic model is really weird, incidentally, because it's like a, comp a political compromise, because it still has the Earth at the center of the, so of the galaxy, uh, so I don't know if we call it a solar system, what should we call it if it's, because the sun, that implies the sun's at the center. Whatever that thing is, we now call the solar system. Um, but he would have the, so he had the Earth at the middle, but he had all the other planets rotating around the sun. Right, that's the Tychonic model, it's really weird. It's not the Ptolemaic model, it's in between. And Kepler came along with this totally trivial model, that much, much more simple, by the way, mathematically, for the mathy people, the Fourier series of the Ptolemaic model is infinite because the orbit is elliptical and you're summing circular basis functions. They kept coming along with this ridiculously simple model. And I think everyone must have laughed at it because it was so bloody silly. It was so simple. It was, uh, and so they must have thought it was stupid, you know? And I think that's a beautiful example. I bet you that if you went to the history of great ideas, they all, people laugh at them, right? And they mock them. And I think there's something to that. And I, so I think humor is a metaphysical force of creative destruction, you know? And um, so I'm all for it. And I, it's in, in every dimension, you know? Thanks a bunch. That's, that's very insightful. Lots to think about. So very quickly again, because I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, you mentioned scale, which is because uh, I, I had a previous life as a university administrator and scale was always the, the thing we've discussed. And we had a discussion yesterday on rethinking higher education and scale was, is always, always the biggest problem. Right. And I've heard recently there's actually no science of scale, but is, is there, is there sort of a, a not science of scale. I'm sorry. It's science of scaling up. Not, not, mm -hmm. not exactly. Not exactly the same thing. I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. So isn't there a, you know, isn't there a, a sort of a, something very dramatic for us human beings where we have to face the complexity of nature plus the complexity of our own created scaling up? And we sort of can't really deal with two of these systems? Well, I, that's why, you know, my, to the extent you could see me disagreeing with you when you said there wasn't a science of scale because we've worked very extensively on scale and my colleague Jeffrey West wrote a beautiful book called yes I read it it's, you know, it's, so, actually, it's actually a great book uh, yeah so it, it does now you make a good point right um how you scale up um it's interesting um we now have theories which would help us with that um one even, of, sorry you know, even for social systems because the scaling up in social systems is often yeah in, in so, well let me give you an example actually okay. um of a, of a study that just got completed by some of my colleagues here. Uh, it's not published yet. And they were studying universities, actually. And um, this, is st this is stuff that we're gonna get killed for, but I don't really care, you know, when, you know so it's sort of, um, the, or mocked for, which is, so we asked the following question, right? Take a university, how does it measure its productivity? Now that's actually very hard, as you know, that's part of the problem. I mean, it's like scientists, bean counters we all count our papers and our citations of ridiculous things which mean rather little i think um you know people measure dollars administrators unfortunately a provost can only see one metric and that's the money metric um i hope there's no provost in that but you know it's true <laughs> and so and on and on right they all have their favorite one-dimensional scalars uh they're, they're, they're okay um so we said, okay, let's look at multiple metrics for universities and ask what happens when they get bigger? What happens to a research department when it gets bigger, right? And what we found is, not we, I should say, we, I speak as a royal we now. I had no part in this, we as a fight researchers, um, was that it was at best linear or at worst sublinear. So just to make that clear, imagine that you have a research department with five people and you double it to 10. What happens to the number of papers you publish? You double them or less. 
<laughs> right? Um, citations, double them or less, and so on. What this means, just to be clear for everyone in the room here, is that there is absolutely no value to being together. It's a linear scaling, right? In other words, there's no off diagonal terms here. There's no synergy in the data. And there are two possible interpretations of this. One is the metrics suck, right? Because they're not capturing what you care about. Uh, and the other possibility is that, that for these things, universities actually don't help. And if you look at very large research universities, of course they hire more faculty because you get more papers linearly, but you also get more grants linearly. So there is an advantage to growth. It's like getting more customers if you're a company, but that's not the same as saying that by virtue of us being a community, we discover ideas that we would not have discovered independently. So we've been looking at institutes at various sizes as a proxy for the chronological development for scaling up, right? Not because these are in some sense equilibrium points, right? Uh, they're not the trajectory in time. But it seems unfortunate that they all lie on this linear line and um, which raises very interesting questions. So that's one I know we have data on. Um, but I do suspect that that kind of analysis would help you orient, right? So if you would study yourself honestly and then increase in size and continue, you would have data, very, very poor <laughs> proxies that would allow you to measure the effect of the scaling. I, I think this can be done. Um, We've done it, for example, I've worked with both Boeing and Bell Labs looking at their internal scaling. So you, you can do this. Oh, I can't wait. Could you, could you send us the paper when it's ready? We'd uh, love to. Universities, yes. Yeah, 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 we'd love to. I think we would have. So <laughs> I, I, it, just, just a, a bit of an aside, isn't that a bit contrary to how uh, living, living systems, when they scale up, they become more efficient? Wasn't that sort of Jeffrey's West argument also? Yes, I mean, so exactly, that's the problem. I mean, uh, just I remind everyone, um, biological life is very efficient, so it scales sublinearly with respect to metabolic free energy. So if you double the size, you use less than double the energy. Cities are super efficient in informatic variables. So if you double the size of a city, you more than double patent production or GDP per capita. So they're super linearly scaled. Universities are linear, <laughs> so um, it's a problem. And I actually think it's kind of obvious, we all know this, what you have there in your institute, you created it, I imagine, because you wanted community, right? You, mm -hmm. you wanted what SFI did as mm -hmm. well. And universities, as I don't have to tell anyone in that room, don't do this, you're, you're an anomaly. Um, it's rare. And it's important. So, yeah. in, in, the, in the comments, I was, I was writing a point uh, yeah. that, that I, I'm disagreeing with the reasoning here in that, um, but maybe there's something I'm missing, in that if you have more people collaborating, they're, they're, it's, reason, it's, predict, it's like easy to realize that they're going to be publishing either linearly or less but it's the other way more around people, more people are working on the same a number of projects so oh yeah that's actually eastern it's the other way around um james evans at the university of chicago knowledge lab has worked on that so the um you publish many more papers if you publish multi-author papers not less it's the other way around you publish more papers if if you publish multi-author and you get disproportionately more citations if you're multi-author. But that's obvious, right? If you think about the citation process. So it's not, it's the other way around actually. It's, it's one of the forces that's driving large multi-author papers. And each will know this, if you look at the number of authors on papers that come out of CERN, or the citation, I don't know, where are they? Like 150, I mean, it's like 150 authors. And they publish in any given year, 150 or more papers, right? 
<laughs> okay, so then, so then, uh, so then there, there is something peculiar about university that they're somehow not translating this benefit of collaboration to publication. Yeah, but there's a difference again between publishing more and the superlinear scaling of department size. Um, but there is something wrong, yes. <laughs> It's very, very interesting work, by the way, that James does um, there, because one, that's really fascinating. What he's found, for example, in a paper published last year, I believe, um, is if you publish in a very timely topic like COVID with many authors, you get this massive spike, but this really, really short half-life. Whereas single author papers, assuming they're not, you know, nutty, um, accumulate for longer periods of time. So they have a much smaller spike, but a much longer half-life. And, and it's a very robust finding. And moreover, papers that we would consider retrospectively revolutionary are almost never multi-author. And, and, the, and, the, and the sort of, it's like a, um, exploration exploitation concept if you want to do something radical do it on your own if you want to perfect the idea do it with a group or a team mm -hmm. and that's the sort of conclusion he draws from that study oh that's really interesting all right that's that's fascinating so it's almost uh was it past 1 30 yeah it's almost 1 30 so anita or salome uh why don't you want to the two of you ask a uh, final question. Thanks so much, David. Thank well, you. Salome, please, if you, if you want to. Ooh, final question. Um, that's a lot of pressure. Make it good, Salome, come on. Ooh, I've got to make it good. So many interesting things have been talked about. Um, oof, I don't know. Um, ask me about Dune. Ask me about Dune. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> No, 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 I that, was, that was humor. Oh, yeah, that was a sort of humor. I guess, I guess I'm not that good at picking up on humor, Daniel. You'll have to no. give me a hand on that one. Um, no, okay, but in all seriousness, uh, an interesting question. Um, I think. You don't don't force yourself if you if you can't. I don't mind. No, 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 no I, I do actually have a question. Um, what can be said about the importance of because auto self self-regulation is a very important concept. Um, I did a lot of uh, cancer research, so I, uh, a lot of what I worked on was, you know, apoptosis, and there's so many fascinating mechanisms when we think about auto-regulation. Where do you think that same principle could be applied or could be interesting? Um, is there anything that should, that needs to be said about um, putting up more checkpoints <laughs> maybe not biologically but maybe economically or socially yeah no that's that's uh we actually had a conference on this uh, a few years ago um on biological mechanisms of regulation for economic and social systems and not using biology but using the principles of biology right? yeah and um the I think it's extremely profound. Um, the part of the challenge is that regulation is a dirty word for a lot of people working in industry and finance. And because it's confounded with what they view as heavy handed government intervention. I'm just, it's a very politicized thing. And, but I actually think that there's a huge amount to be learned from the regulation of complex systems that have evolved, which have had, you know, billions of years of experimentation time, right? That civilization table I showed you, what have we got? Ancient Sumer, 5,000 years, that's nothing, right? So there's no doubt we could learn a great deal. And, and the, the, the ethical conundrum, to be honest, is how do you learn from the evolution of biological systems without coming across as being a biological determinist mm -hmm. in some or at worst advocating some kind of social darwinism some spencerian 
pseudoscience. And I think we've not, we don't know how to deal with that. Um, one of the nice things about complex systems is it, it abstracts the principle away from biology. So it's not so much biology, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a kind of uh, how you maintain an ordered, semi-ordered state. Um, but I, I have no doubt about it that we actually wrote a paper on regulation recently. I could share it with Olivia or what have you. Um, but it's not so much social, but it's something we've thought about. Um, and where it's come up a lot recently, just so you know, we invested at SFI actually very heavily in crypto. Um, in fact, I'm very pleased to tell you that our second campus was built by in our investments in Bitcoin. And uh, in fact, we call it the campus that Bitcoin built. And I say that to an annoy some of my uh, more conservative board members um, who thought this was very imprudent. And it probably was incredibly imprudent to do that. But that is a field, by the way, uh, where there's an enormous amount to be learned, actually, in mm. terms of regulatory principles, especially in the, in the domain of smart contracts, in Ether, um, more than in the Bitcoin world. So, so but one could say a lot about that. Okay, very yeah. interesting. That was my, yeah. one of my original um, research questions for this, um, for this project at Building 21. Um, and I think I had started off with the question, well, what can we learn conceptually from science? Um, so it's my, my approach is very much from a biological or physiological point of view, but it's very interesting to talk about um, concepts in this way. Then again, sometimes it's it's hard to see the applications, and I've myself run into this entire uh, reductionist or deterministic argument, and um, it, it had to be just a big disclaimer in the paper I'm writing because it's one of those it, it's a it's a pretty fundamental problem to the entire question. Um, I think it's finding those areas where it, it can be novel and interesting to talk about is is where it's challenging, but probably the most rewarding. So, very you know, one thing I would, I would suggest is, and again, there's a bigger thing, is, is that, and this is a whole thing, but essentially, if you think about the calculus, so that was obviously invented by a few people um, who we could discuss, and to deal with problems in, in celestial mechanics. But now it's used all over the bloody place, right? I mean, it's as useful. And so you use it in chemical kinetics and you use it for betting on things and you use it, use it for everything. And Darwin discovered a set of principles which actually completely transcend biology. And um, just happened to discover them there, right? And, uh, and it, you could think of it in a boring sense as just a mechanism of optimization, right? Where you mm -hmm. have very decentralized agents, but you can there are more profound readings of what that is in terms of information theory and so on. So the way I think about this more is that there are domains like that are model systems. It's like saying I work on a mouse, but it's not a mouse that I care about. It's on it's mm -hmm. it's the homeotic mutants or something. And I think that theory, for interesting historical reasons, often gets discovered in certain domains first because they're sort of closer to it. But then you realize that the theory can be applied very generally. I think regulation is exactly one of those. And you should be able to talk about it completely biology free. Mm -hmm. By the way, my former colleague, Sean Carroll, did you read Sean? He, he, not the physicist, but the geneticist. He wrote um, a book called Serengeti yeah. Rules. Which yeah, I come across it when I looked into it, yeah, have a, preliminary research. <laughs> have a peek at that because that book is a little bit about the broader principle of regulation in nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the other questions, uh, maybe it's not, I mean, it seems relevant, but I've always asked myself to which, de to, to what degree will association be helpful if it's an association? And that it's true that, um, and this is what I was thinking about when I was researching and writing on the topic of regulation is that, of course, it's true that these concepts hold across different disciplines, but it still feels like a pure association, which isn't always very interesting. So where is that boundary between um, speculative association and grounded and interest, uh, if, you, if you understand what I mean? 
No, I do. Uh, the other field that that has this quality is um, economics. Mm -hmm. And Marshall, the Cambridge School of Economics grew out of uh, the physics department. And um, so when Keynes was working there, mm -hmm. he inherited a tradition of essentially the tradition that we would now call dynamical systems. And um, people often point out that economics is maybe excessively beholden to rigors that it can't live up to empirically. I mean, it's a, it's a disconnect between the messiness here and the theory here, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and you can trace that to Marshall's contribution to the development of economic theory at Cambridge um, very explicitly. So that root, what you're calling the association, never completely disappears. And only now, perhaps, is it slowly sort of uh, volatilizing. Mm. <laughs> but, but it's very long lived, that association, yeah. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, Anita, do you have anything to add? I think those were all my questions. Um, actually, at this point, the biggest thing I wanted to say was thank you. It's been so refreshing for me. And it's so meaningful, even just to hear you say that you you intuitively agree with what we're doing at Building 21. Actually, it's more than intuitive. I intellectually <laughs> agree with what you're doing. Well, yeah. thank you for that. It's, yeah. you know, every so often you need a push of enthusiasm or motivation, and that was more than a push. So thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, I found it fascinating. I'll have lots to think about. Somebody else in the audience who hasn't spoke up just wrote to me to say, to bring up a, another scholar's project, maybe just to hear your take on it, mm -hmm. which was last semester we had two PhD students from, where were they from? Physics and economics? Yeah, one was from, I think, mechanical engineering and the other, and with an undergrad in physics, I think, and the other one from econ. But they basically wanted to look at whether or not they could quantum mechanically model the uncertainties in mining. And so they were basically quantum mechanically modeling a very uh, macroscopic systems, but the sense of joy and happiness with which they went about their project was one thing that was kind of infectious. And the other was it really brought to mind, okay, maybe they might actually come up with something that none of us have occurred to before. But Rebecca, it was you that secretly asked me, did you have something that you wanted to hear about this? <laughs> no, no, no. I just wanted to show you the full breadth, a little bit of, of what we're exploring here. So. No, that's interesting. I. Uh, and again, you know, these are sort of, you know, warrens of exploration here. I mean, the, I think there are two interpretations of a project like that for me, like when I hear that kind of talk. And certainly we heard talks that merge those worlds. One is more um, methodological, right? So there are just nice tools um, for studying a certain kind of process, a sort of stochastic process deterministically, which has some interesting properties and tools from quantum mechanics can be useful. Um, methodological tools, not ontological assumptions. And that's where it starts getting more tricky is when um, there are claims made about ontology, right? So for example, principles of spooky action at a distance or entanglement and that and then that gets to be more of an argument, uh, you know, about whether or not that's overreaching. Um, I, don't, I don't know, because I don't know the project. But certainly, to, to get to Salome's question, all of these fields are running away developing amazing methods and ideas that should not be restricted to the problem domain, right? I mean, it's, oh, that's good. Let me nab that and put it over there, and it's very powerful. And, um, but I think in... Santa Fe Institute, Building 21, we have to sort of develop a kind of very uh, astute perception for whether an epistemological point is being made or an ontological point. <laughs> and I don't think that speakers even know themselves often which they have in mind. I mean, that's fine, right? If, and that's a kind of a skill actually to develop uh, that's useful. On this, uh, David, one day we would love to get you back and so we can exactly on that point between the epistemological and the ontological to hear you talk about beauty because this is something you've also 
addressed in some of your interviews. Uh, it'd be really interesting. Let me also extend an, an, uh, an invitation to Building 21 once we, you know, go back to the normal world, hopefully this summer or this fall. We would love to have you at Building 21, which is actually a real space. <laughs> we, we actually have a real space. I will add, Olivier, just sorry to go on and on, but one of the projects I've been working on during COVID with a philosopher colleague is a book called The Transcendent Triangle. Um, and the Transcendent Triangle is a short monograph on uh, aesthetics, evidence, and ethics. Oh, I'd love to see that. Told through 50 case studies. Mm -hmm. So things like the legal notepad, uh, the works of Arthur Conan Doyle, the Manhattan Project, little essays on how you balance the ethical, the evidentiary, and you know the aesthetic and what is aesthetics i consider it the most powerful of all three but it, just so you know i could talk about hopefully that book will be finished i can talk about the book so can you can we invite you to, to do a launch at building 21 oh yeah that'd either, be fun. That'd either be, to, to come and talk to about the book either in person I'm or to talk about it. i mean that puts some pressure on us to actually finish it but that's, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and for your benefit you'd probably choose summer or fall <laughs> right, right, yeah. Montreal winter is interesting. <laughs> no, you get a change from sunny weather. It's fine. Well, I think the virus calls the shots these days. Yeah. Anyway, right, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, yeah, so very much interested in that, that, that thing. Great. So, thank you so much again for your time and thank your you generosity. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciate it. Wonderful Bye. meeting you and talking with you all. Um, and I hope to see you all again. I mean, before, whenever. Too long. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you, David. Have a good day, sir. Thank you.